tell you, um, I have a lot of information, um, and, and it's all in this book, which is free. But I brought some, I always bring some when I speak, um, in the back, and it tells um, all the little uh, minutia of, of what I'm not going to say. And you think, did, gee, did she get something? I can't believe it, because there's a lot to talk about. Um, but where does it? Where do you start? Uh, Clinton County has a population of 80,000. It's the site of the longest uh, continuous manned military base in the United States. It's the site of two battles, each were significant to securing um, our independence from Britain: Revolutionary War battle, about Battle of Alcor, and the Battle of Pittsburgh from the War of 1812. In New York State, there are 28 counties that are smaller than Clinton County and 33 larger. We did not host a large march or any other nationally significant event. And we do not have a name you would recognize as outstanding to the suffrage movement. But we do have a story to tell. A story about everyday men and women who struggled on behalf of New York women's suffrage over a very long period of time. They were veterans of a battle, fought in meeting rooms and at home. Many didn't live to vote, and with the centennial this year of that privilege we all have, it's relevant to tell their story over and over. And issues still remain, but far fewer than 100 years ago. In 1848, women in the United States did not have the right to their wages, the right to their children, and lost all rights once married. The first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York, actually put voting as the last thing on their list, with other rights coming first. At the Seneca Falls Convention, their Declaration of Independence simply added that all men and women should be treated equally. The Clinton County story began in 1855 with a visit by Susan B. Anthony. Ms. Anthony was an agent of the Women's Rights Society of New York at this time. It's significant to our county story in two ways. It was the first recorded suffrage event in the county. And second, a young girl, Hannah Strait, who went on to be called the mother of Clinton County suffrage, was at this meeting. And maybe there's a third significance. The local newspaper complimented Miss Anthony on her modest and retiring manner, <laughs> while giving a strong message by concluding in the report that in no country is better deference paid to women than in the United States, and we think she has no right to complain of her social position here. So says the reporter for the Plattsburgh Republican in Clinton County. This was for the reporter's conclusion of the relevance of this event for those who read the paper. But the visit impacted Hannah. Where was that picture taken by what street? Clinton Hall. Oh, I thought you would ask. I don't know. But it's, it's from our collection, and it exists, and I do not know exactly where it is. I'm always asked the question that I have. I'll tell you the next one that I now know the answer to. <laughs> but that is impossible. So jumping to nearly 20 years later, after the Civil War, during which the suffrage movement was put aside, the Plattsburgh papers were relatively quiet, but news must have been creeping in from somewhere to the point where a local merchant would make fun of the suffragists by pretending that suffragists might be at their store. Little did PNS Monash know that Anna Dickinson and Wendell Phillips would really be coming to town and attracting an audience about the size of which they could only dream to have at their shop. The first credit must be given to this lady, Ida Leggett, who was the first local woman, woman to hit the stump for suffrage in Clinton and Essex County. The good Templars in every community supported temperance, supporters and suffragists. Uh, Ida approached an issue that would be repeated again and again by suffragists. Women needed to be trained the same as men. 
Ida goes further by saying this training would probably raise women to levels above the men. In Ida's September 1870 letter to the Pittsburgh Sentinel, she described herself as strong-minded and crusty. She was, however, an actress too. So the article is romantic and poetic. But to the point, she says, yes, girls, the days of dolls and butterflies has passed. Men want helpmates and companions for wives, not know-nothings. In the 1892 census, she was noted as being born in France with MD as an occupation. Her husband was a hotel keeper of Castle Rustico in Lake Placid. Ida, unfortunately, left the area to open a sanitarium in Lake Helen, Florida, and that structure still exists today. There were two notable discussions in um, 1872, one early in the year. The Young Men's Debating Club hosted Mr. Herman Dieter, who was superintendent of the local horse nail factory. He was from Pennsylvania and perhaps didn't know his audience. He made it clear that the extension of the rights of women is a fundamental principle of all social progress. And he knew his audience and felt they need not fear the result. His entire pro-suffrage speech was recorded in the Essex County Republican, not a Clinton County newspaper. This paper, though, was published by the Lansings, a local family of human rights activists. Later in the year, the Plattsburgh Literary Club hosted a suffrage debate, which might have been entitled, Am I Not a Citizen? This was a very conservative group, but at least they were dealing with the subject. And then, Anna Dickinson came to town. She was the Joan of Arc of the Civil War, and she was now earning more money on the lecture circuit than Mark Twain, and she was speaking on suffrage. She took Plattsburgh by storm, there were full descriptions of her manner, her dress, her message in both local newspapers. Her message was, nothing can be, will be handed to you. You can't expect to get something for nothing. The hall was packed with citizens, voting and non-voting. There was a vote in 1875 to bring the matter of suffrage to the New York State Legislature, to no avail. And the sarcastic uh, Plattsburgh Republican said, sorry, but afraid not. Just as you would respond to the child asking for more candy, or perhaps to stay up just a little bit later. In January of 1879, Susan B. Anthony returned to Plattsburgh. She was reported to be toned down, which is interesting because um, <laughs> They, they reported that she was, she was already toned down in 1855, and now she was again toned down. Um, although, they say she was uh, seen as intense, earnest, and persistent. She spoke on both temperance and suffrage. She spoke for two hours. And Wendell Phillips came in February of 1879, hosted by the Young Men's uh, Association, and was received by the largest audience in memory. He was an abolitionist and an early advocate for women's rights. He also argued that the 14th Amendment, in fact, included Native Americans. He died in 1894. His work was definitely not done. A respected Plattsburgh judge, Winslow Watson, also spoke out against women, clearly against women doing the same work for half the pay, with the bottom line, it was believing that the national creed was equal suffrage, yet half the population of the United States were not allowed to vote. In 1882, a woman's suffrage bill was presented to the New York Assembly, and <coughs> our county assemblyman, B.D. Clapp, voted for the suffrage bill. More voted against. By 1890, women's clubs were appearing, and Marie Booth, who would continue to be active in the suffrage movement. There was a large push in April of 1894 to encourage local women to be more active in the suffrage movement. There was a warming up of the crowd for the county convention 
done by Sarah Winthrop Smith from the National Women's Suffrage Association. She traveled to six outlying county communities to promote this convention and to promote suffrage as a right of citizenship. Our county suffragists were involved, Hannah Lansing, Hannah Street Lansing and her daughter, Ida Wilcox, and women from Osable, Beekmantown, Blackbrook, Champlain, Denimora, Ellenburg, Moores, and six Plasburg districts. And if you know the Clinton County, that really kind of covers it, you know? Cherubusco was missing, but Cherubusco falls in later. So, on April 26, the County Suffrage Convention began. Big names in suffrage came and spoke. Mary Seymour Howell, representing the National American Women's Suffrage Association, was looking for a million signatures throughout New York State, including Clinton County, of course. It was pointed out that the power of the petition um, was so so um, was was such that eventually we would have the power to vote. Mary May Mills who was often described as pleasing in some form or another, <laughs> in this case as a lady of fine executive ability and pleasing address. She was well placed to win friends for suffrage throughout um, through Thought, the Plattsburgh Sentinel reporter. Reporters were beginning to change their mind uh, from that first, uh, that first reaction to Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony did return. Uh, she, uh, she packed the courthouse and received more respect from the reporter and the audience. And this would be her last visit to Clinton County. Hannah Strait, the girl who was impressed by Susan B. Anthony in 1855, was now Hannah Lansing, having married into a family which supported suffrage. At the time of this convention, she was already an author, an editor, a teacher, and a humanitarian, and now a suffragist. She was a Plattsburgh girl who married into a family of social activists. In, the Febu in February, and I don't expect you to see this letter, but I put it up because it does exist in SUNY, uh, special collections at SUNY Plattsburgh. In February, prior to the county convention, she, uh, Hannah Lansing had written to the Wyoming governor, uh, John Osborne, asking if suffrage was in fact working. And he responded, that he replied and said that he immediately, so he felt that every state would do well to follow Wyoming's example. This letter is in special collections, and it's very cool. Um, Wyoming, as a, um, a territory, uh, provided full suffrage in uh, 1869, and then later, as a state, they confirmed that women had the right to vote, continued to have the right to vote. So Hannah headed up the committee which presented this resolution, ur urging the New York Constitutional Convention to submit an amendment striking out the word male from Article 2, Section 1 of our state constitution. The constitution said, every male citizen of the age of 21 years who has been a citizen for 90 days in the country and for at least 30 days a resident of the district can vote. Local lawyer Charles Hazley Moore brought the recommendation of the group to the State Constitutional Convention, and it was not accepted. All the while, temperance and suffrage groups were not working together, certainly not in Clinton County. Each felt the other would take, take an emphasis away from their cause. Herman Beter had told people there would be nothing to fear from suffrage, except if you wanted easy access to liquor, it was thought maybe the female vote would change that. As years passed, more suffrage clubs emerged, and meetings uh, eventually moved out of the homes and into permanent locations. In the interest of being seen to consider all options, the political study club advertised that aunties were welcome. Yeah, they were called aunties. They were always me. 
So during my research, I was fascinated by the subtle marketing, and maybe not so subtle marketing, around elixirs for women. The assumption was that women may not be strong enough to vote. This was in the um, Plattsburgh Sentinel. May not be strong enough to vote unless medicated for their many mysterious ills. And these ads, <laughs> this is just one ad, these ads use suffrage to advertise their wares. And this one was for a tonic which prevented women from becoming violently ill without apparent cause. Most of the elixirs, as it turns out, contained a high percentage of alcohol. <laughs> States granting suffrage were making the news in Clinton County. Um, at the turn of the century, though, only four states offered full suffrage. A suffrage activist for many years was Harriet Dudley Bell. Um, call, we call her, I call her Hattie, um, and other, her friends did. Uh, she was another Plattsburgh woman. Actually, she was from Keene and moved into Plattsburgh. She was in every club and often hosted club meetings in her home. She was known as a personality by my grandmother, whose father, would, coincidentally, was an anti-suffragist. Her obituary says she was one of the original members of the Susan B. Anthony movement, one of the few obituaries that mentions involvement in the suffrage movement. She was also a member, uh, she's a member of our family, and um, I have her, her grandkids or her great-grandkids are my cousins, and they had no idea that she played such a role in the Clinton County suffrage. It's kind of sad. The Plattsburgh bond issue came up for streets and sewers, and it was turned into a challenge for the George women, the George William Curtis Club. The property owners were ch uh, challenged to vote. Did they really vote on something that they were allowed to? There were a thousand eligible voters, men and women. Only 258 in total voted. Does this sound bad? It sounds typical, doesn't it? I mean, we get a chance to vote and we don't. And 76 um, of the 258 were women. There's not too much relevance can be given to these numbers since we don't know how many women owned the property and how many women didn't vote. <coughs> But in any event, the female vote was trapped. So all who had voted, all who voted, voted for the bond issue. Many suffragists came to Clinton County to support the movement and try to sway voters. Each have a significant story of their own. Anna Shaw, Harriet May Mills, Inez Mulholland, and Carrie Chapman McCann. And anti-suffragists came to town. Marjorie Dorman had spoken against suffrage in front of the U.S. Congress. Women also came in from states that already had full suffrage, such as Colorado and Washington State. And to me, that's a significant effort for somebody to come from Washington State to Plattsburgh, New York. The list grew longer, and our, country, our county got sig significant attention. John Milholland had family in the area. His diary said he had dinner with the Booths. Marie and Judge John Booth were both active in the suffrage movement. John Milholland came to Plattsburgh before and after Inez's death. New groups were forming in the county, perhaps as a result of suffrage. The Women's Civic League was, league was formed and its members were of a social and executive prominence. So this wasn't anybody, just anybody that got into this league, apparently. But it was the first time women were allowed to join the Chamber of Commerce. Their vague mandate was to concentrate on making the city more livable. The first function this group held, though, was to invite Inez Mulholland to speak. Suffragist Marie Booth was the first chair of the group, and later suffragist Lillian Pike Everest um, was president. In the published list of the members of this group, there were declared anti-suffragists, so the choice of Inez as a speaker was surprising. And yes, Plattsburgh had its anti-suffrage group. 
This group parroted the opinions of other anti-suffrage groups. Coincidentally, the suffragists set up an office right next to the Hager block. It was a building owned by anti-suffragist Frank Hager. Huh. Ah, Sue Hager. What about that? <laughs> yep. In Frank's book, among other things, he was against educated women beyond men as it would cause them to shun domestic work and therefore disrupt the family. His girls went to the Plattsburgh Normal School and his boys to Union College. In the early 1900s, this was posted on Plattsburgh Daily Press's women's page. Are we doomed to freakish suffrage demonstrations in this country? Yep, Creeps and Monsters, this was part of a lecture given to a class of girls graduating from high school. This was the, key, the topic of their keynote speaker. Duan was considered a rabid anti-suffragist. There's a big long story about this man. But... Many cartoons were published about suffragists. This is just a sample. But the man is always made to look hard done by him. And the woman is not interested in her family. This was featured in the paper as a big debate. Norman had spoken before Congress against suffrage. And while she conceded that women were smart enough to do men's work, she did not feel men were smart enough to do women's work. <laughs> Since she was an anti-suffragist, she was concerned that women's work would not get done. Suffragist uh, Harriet May Mills was recorded as win winning this debate. It could not be denied that women in more and more states were getting full suffrage. Most of the county small towns held suffrage meetings. At least 11 have been documented. Along with this documentation were the name, uh, names of the women. Mrs. John Doe, Mrs. William Doe, Mrs. Stephen Doe, whatever their last name, their, their first name was, was a mystery. And in order to get first names, and I got most all of them, I had to go to the DAR or to their obituaries. And that's how he found out what their first their first names was. And in this, I, I use their first names. I, re <laughs> I don't call them Miss or Mrs. either. But I was really, really, uh, I was really taken. I mean, I understood that that's what happened, but it's really kind of uh, interesting that they were so um, mysterious to me at first. But the other point is, their spouses were part of the story. Because the spouse's name was part of, the, it was listed. So, um, whether they wanted to be or not, they were part of the story. This woman I find is amazing. She, uh, she was, uh, her sister was one of the major suffragists. Uh, her sister is Marie Parker's booth. And, um, but she was a personality. She was remembered by her family as being very directive in her old age. Cranky, let's say, not as appreciated as she should have been. And I wrote up the story and gave it to her family, and they said, oh my gosh, this is who this was. <laughs> Doc felt if a woman could vote on a child's education, why not child labor? If a woman could vote for a new school, why not a new post office? Why cannot women vote for it all? As a reporter, she provided articles for the newspaper on suffrage. She was a star representing Washington State in the living flag during the suffragist parade in New York City in 1915. And she was the first woman employed as head of balance of supply division of the War Department in 1917. Later, she toured abroad studying economic conditions of women she was the president of the New York State Federation of Women's Clubs, a Washington lobbyist for the Bill of Education and Child Labor, Congressional Secretary for the National Committee for the Department of Education, Congressional Secretary um, of the National League of Women Voters, and she was friends with um, Carrie Chapman Catt 
and was appointed by Carrie Chapman Cat to be the head of the Clinton County League of Women Voters. The Antis officially organized in Plattsburgh noticed their opinion on the black man's vote. We already have enfranchised a mass of men who are unfit to vote. Will the doubling of that number improve conditions? I mean, really, take it as an insult. Every way you look at it. And they posted their position in the local newspapers and for their opinion of women voting, and doubling the expense, doubling the corruption, and doubling the number of ignorant voters. And to the bitter end, the Antis held meetings, and their names were listed too. A number listed as Anti went on to become members of the League of Women Voters. My grandmother, who thought Inez Mulholland was a show voter, went on to vote at every opportunity for the rest of her life. <coughs> in preparation for the November 2nd, 1915 vote for suffrage in, in New York State, a meeting was held in Plattsburgh that said, was said to be the largest ever. It was supported by dignitaries and took coverage space in the newspapers. Here, Hannah Lansing was honored as the mother of Clinton County suffrage and as she recalled for the audience the day she first met Susan B. Anthony. But, the November 2nd vote, there was to be no suffrage, women's suffrage, in 1915 for New York State women. Clinton County voted like the rest of the state, but the tone of the newspaper was different. The sarcasm was for those who voted against suffrage. Newspaper reporting on suffrage ramped up. Suffrage hits in, were about 117 in 1916, but in a, about 298 in 1917. But still, no reports of marching in the streets, but more and more activity. Like many of our suffragists, Hannah Strait Lansing did not live to vote. But she would have been proud and happy as support for suffrage unrolled in 1916. The Methodists came out in favor, they backed uh, women's suffrage. The Grange officially backed it too, as did unions of female workers. And finally, the WCTU in Clinton County embraced suffrage. Um, a side story of that is that um, the woman, the woman that was in charge of the WCTU in the area passed away in 1913. What's WCTU? Um, <laughs> Temperance um, Union Women's... Temperance. All right. Okay. Women's Christian. Christian Temperance Union, exactly, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's two questions. <laughs> All right. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and these are the two ladies, uh, Lillian Pike Everest and Marie Parker's Booth, who were suffragists, um, who made the impression in this uh, this meeting. <laughs> These, these pictures are in the Clinton County Historical Association. Uh, we have 17,000 portraits that were taken from uh, 1890 right through to about, uh, I don't know, 1920. And I found these two there. I was thrilled to do that. A suffrage tent had been set up at the old base in 1915, and it would be allowed again until women's suffrage had been won. Plattsburgh branch of the New York Suffrage Party was established in late 1916. The vote was moving east. This was printed in the February 23, 1917 edition of the Plattsburgh Sentinel, which, except for the front page, which was devoted to the war, 
They devoted this issue to women's suffrage. <laughs> anyway, the world the world grows right up, uh, grows whiter. I don't know. Somehow that I don't think that <laughs> title will go over today. Um, anyway, back to the many meetings were planned in preparation for another vote that was going to be uh, in 1917. <coughs> Another vote for suffrage from New York State. Meeting after meeting after meeting, and they were all over. They went to Moores and Rouse's Point, um, Morrisonville, West Chazy, all over. And finally, Wilson figured out which side to, of the bread to butter, you know? <laughs> Once <laughs> he was against suffrage, and now, hmm, with the number, See, I, I, with a number of states with full suffrage, he changed his mind. I'm sure that's not related. Um, and he changed his mind, fortunately, before the New York State vote. Thank you. And there was a final push with Margaret Foley coming from Massachusetts and uh, Lenny Carl from Oregon. Massachusetts did not have full suffrage. These ladies went from town to town in our county. The county was also assigned a full-time support person, Edna Wright. Uh, Edna Wright was here for four months solid in Clinton County. And after that, because of her great work in Clinton County, she went on to Washington, D.C. to help gain the passage of the 19th Amendment. So we had rallies in all these towns. They were in the newspaper. They were publicized. How to vote was strongly suggested. <laughs> the store, Myers and Belden, still used suffrage as a joke. <laughs> yeah, this was in 1917. And the, w, the Women's Christian Temperance Union strongly uh, supported suffrage. So they're preparing for the November 6th vote. Again, there was lots of confidence. And this this same, this, I don't know if I can do this, 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 this same wording, would, you would have read it almost in uh, in preparation for the 1915, 1915 vote. It was about the same thing. But the suffragists of the city are confident of the success. And you know, when you think of it, how helpless we all women were because you just had to have confidence because you had no power. As in the newspaper encouraged men to vote for woman suffrage. War was used as a reason for women to have the vote so they could have a voice in their own government. And the watchers, this is quite an amazing list. This is where I got a lot of them. My, and, and you can see there's um, uh, Hattie Bell's there, and Marie Booth is here, and Doc Parkhurst is right here. Um, our suffragists were in this. Um, this is this woman, Helen Blumhauer. She was also quite an amazing woman as far as the suffrage, um, the suffrage movement in the county went. Um, Watchers. They were called watchers, and it turns out that um, they were assigned to the polling places to help voters. And this practice was started in the 1915 election, but I didn't ever get a list like that for that. And it continues to this day because we go, you go to the polling system, and and they're not called watchers anymore, but they're there to help. So this was the vote. And um, if you ask me, 53.9%. If somebody saw that vote today, they'd want to recount right away, wouldn't they? That was too close, but, you know, majority rules, and they went, they stuck with that. But in Clinton County, 
3,622 uh, 3, voters remained against suffrage. But since the popular vote in the state counted, the work done by suffragists and voters in Clinton County was still very meaningful. The 19th Amendment giving women suffrage nationally, nationally was finally on the table with the same wording since uh, for 41 years. If you can imagine devoting, uh, other than your children maybe, or your family, devoting 41 years to a cause, that's pretty, pretty serious. And actually it was like 70 years from, you know, if you count it from 1848. So this year we're commemorating this event on behalf of women in the United States who had, could not have voted until the 19th Amendment was passed. Like those in the 13 original colonies, like Vermont. Um, I thought it was quite, I would have expected Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and New Hampshire to be ahead of everything, but no, they weren't. Instead it was Wyoming and, and Utah and Colorado. And, Thank goodness. So, Carrie Chapman Catt, whose name is third in my books only to Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, said this, and pauseless was the uh, working word. This was right after, she's counting right after the Civil War. Can you read it? To get the word male in effect, out of the Constitution cost the women of the country 52 years of pauseless campaign. So in Clinton County, we had our local heroes, probably not on anyone's list, but definitely on our list. It's for them that we continue to tell the story of a battle fought and won, and of a job well done. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. You're welcome. So, so the whole story, and I, I lots of bits and pieces. The, the interesting thing about this is I went to, um, uh, I gave a, a presentation on Clinton County uh, suffrage history to uh, uh, women and gender studies, women and gender studies at SUNY Plattsburgh. And the kids in the class um, were each given an assignment to take something out of my presentation and to specialize on that subject and to write. So, so my two cents is in the front and their, their two cents is in the back. So and we published whatever they said. We didn't, uh, I fact checked a little bit, but not too much. And um, so and we have this, uh, so they were published. We published four students. Uh, it was a class of seven. We had a possibility of five, and the one, you had to get all sorts of paperwork done, you know, and sign them off, but they didn't, so. Anyway, that's what we have. Hey, Helen, could you talk about the auto uh, event this summer. Are yes, you able to there's do that? an auto tour. Um, the and the back and I don't. I didn't put that beautiful picture up, and I should have because okay. in 1911 the auto tour went through Clinton County, and the women would travel in an automobiles from town to town with the suffrage message. So um, we're uh, reenacting that this summer. Um, uh, we have a grant um, from the Basin Program. Um, we just happened to be in it. It really was put on by a Glenn Spall's group. They, they put it all together. Um, but then we realized that, wait a minute, it, probably, it might have started in Plattsburgh. And so, and we have proof that they came here. And so we're starting it off in Plattsburgh. And Susan B. Anthony's going to be opening it up. Because um, she was in Plattsburgh. And she's going to open up, reenact, and a reenactor's going to open up the tour. And it's going to start in Plattsburgh. Um, People will be introduced to Hattie Bell, to uh, Hannah Lansing, to, and this is August 1st, to uh, Marie Booth and um, Doc Parkhurst and Lillian uh, Pike Evers. So there will, all those women will be here on August 1st. And um, 
will head off, and because we've been loaned um, uh, autos, but automobiles, but they're kind of going to be more late 1927s, maybe eights, because I was told that their 1920 automobiles don't really work anymore. <laughs> so, but I thought, that's fine. who's going to know? I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, they're going to bring us to the North Star Underground Railroad Museum in the afternoon, and they're going to be telling the story of um, the uh, black women's struggle in suffrage, because theirs was different. They had, um, they were um, pushed away from the, and they were, they were very strong, there were some very strong women in that, in that movement, and they weren't, you know, they were asked not to come to a march, and do all those, they had the other challenges, they had the challenge of, of um, of the suffrage groups, you know, to to, um, to struggle over. So um, that story you'll find out um, on, in the afternoon of August first. So then um, the next day is Sunday, and we're going down to uh, Lewis uh, for Inez Mulholland's um, uh, a reenactment down there, talking about Inez Mulholland. Her grave is down there, and uh, that will be in the morning. And then the afternoon they're going to Westport. Uh, and I don't know what's happening in Westport, but I'm sure it's going to be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first weekend in August. The next weekend in August, um, they're going to be um, in Crown Point and Scroon Lake. And um, see, we have a meeting in about a week <laughs> to finalize the schedule. I know what my schedule is, but not theirs. Um, and then we'll also be we'll be ending up the final the final weekend. We'll be in. Um, at the Crandall Library in Glens Falls. So we're going to end up in Glens Falls. So every, every group is going to sort of um, tell their own story from their own place. So and we're really excited because the tea, the tea tents that they had at the base, we're, Clay County Historical Association is on the base. And they had these, these tents there, um, the suffrage tents were on the base. So we're just the perfect place to start. What do you think? Yes. I, uh, thank you for adding that content. And I was wondering, you talked about your grandmother being involved, is that right? Actually, it was my great-grandfather great who was the father of my grandmother. My grandmother was not, she, she, she was not involved in suffrage, except she was in the DAR. She was in the Tuesday Club. And Hattie Bell, I have letters in the families from Hattie Bell because mm -hmm. they, were, they were related because Hattie's daughter married, um, married my grandmother's brother. Okay. So she was in the family, and I know all these lovely cousins that know nothing mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. So They do now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting because I don't know why this wasn't touted as something wonderful to be part of, because I had to tell the, the Booth family about their aunt, Dot Parkers. And Which they Booth family? Kit, Kit Booth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they're, they're very well known in our community and they're definitely active, uh, you know, citizens. And uh, so it was really fun. And also Lillian Pike Everest, she's from, she was, you know, if anybody knows Clinton County, if you don't know Clinton County, this won't mean anything. She was, she was uh, born in Scioto. Now, Scioto is like some little blink somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, so, and she, be, you know, she went on to be educated somehow and all this, and she married a, a lawyer in Champlain, and so she ended up, you know, and she was beautiful, if you remember the picture, she was just beautiful. But her family knew nothing about this, because there, it wasn't, didn't appear in a lot of obituaries. It wasn't Hattie Bell's obituary, but, um, and, but it wasn't in Marie's, or, um, or so, yeah. So was Lansing in relation to uh, Marjorie Lansing Porter? Uh, yeah, Hannah, Hannah Straight Lansing was the grandmother of Marjorie Lansing Porter, who was a, a, um, a well-known historian in Clinton and Essex County. Very well-respected historian. She mentioned a couple of things. I got a couple of pieces of information from Marjorie Lansing Porter. But again, not at the level you'd expect for what, what these women did. Does anyone else have a suffragist story? Did you talk about jets versus gists? Because well, I didn't know gist. for a long so time. You're, just right. a, you're a gist if you're in the United States. Yes, yeah. and a suffragette. Oh. 
if you're from Britain. Britain. So, and you'll often see women's suffrage versus women's suffrage. Well, it's women's suffrage is it's suffrage is the right to vote. Mm -hmm. So it's Negro suffrage, woman suffrage. It's you know, yeah. So, Mr. Phelps, do you remember any of your grandparents talking about it? Old old island name? No. So, okay. Yeah, it's interesting in Vermont. I was trying to, and I didn't have time, and I apologize. That's I was okay. trying to find a little more Vermont information, yeah. and the one thing I found was the first, according to the newspapers, which in those days you know they're just like ours today, I think to some extent, I guess. Um, but the newspaper was it was 1870, and the first woman's, they said it was the first meeting on women's suffrage, and they elected a group. But they felt that the um, the officers had to be men because they were the only ones that would have the right to vote. So these women were part of this group. That that did not happen in Clinton County, I have to say. But that was uh, that was interesting when I found that out. That the first they claimed they were the first group, and it was run by men. So New York beat, it, beat Vermont to the punch on this one. Um, <laughs> also on voting. That's right. Because Vermont's story is not, and I expect, uh, you know, it's funny. I expected more from Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, you know. I just, it, it's just funny where, why? I, I don't know why. You have to be there. I had to have been there, right? Yeah. But Vermont, even in, we have Women's Equality Day now. It's August 26th. Um, because that's the day when every woman in the in August 26, um, 2020, was the day when every uh, woman in, in the United, United States United. had the right to vote. Thank you. So we we celebrate it every year. I do, we do this at Clinton County, a historical association with the League of Women Voters, and we commemorate uh, Women's Equality Day, August 26. But um, so women here in Vermont had the right to vote August 26, but Vermont had not signed off, and what what happened was they got rid of their governor, and the, <laughs> the following the year the new governor signed. So, um, you were, sorry, we have a yes. couple of questions. Yeah. So, uh, once women get the right to vote, then that increases the population and then their representation in Congress, but only once it went national. So, for instance, like uh, Wyoming gives women the right to vote. That doesn't. That didn't change their uh, representation in Congress. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know how that worked. Because that would be a, an incentive for especially those uh, lightly populated yeah. Western states. Yeah. 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 Because then they have. You know, yeah. Okay. Jeanette Rankin was the first from Montana. I'm sorry? Jeanette Rankin, I believe, was yes. the first congresswoman yes, from Montana. Yes, she was. And she voted against the First World War. So it was roughly this time. I don't know exactly, exactly. when she came. I think it was, I, yes. I want to I have it in here. I, I mentioned her because definitely she's uh, she's definitely a part part of that story. And I, I'm trying to think. Here we are. She was, uh, yeah, she said, we're half the people. We should be half the Congress. That's Janet. Uh, Jeanette Rankin, and um, she was the first woman elected to Congress. And I don't know, I didn't have any more in here about her, but uh, I do give her recognition for that. I think she's an interesting story. She, uh, she voted against the First World War. She got a lot of pressure from the women not to do it because they didn't want her to be a stereotypical woman. You know, they wanted her to be pro-war. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so she lost, she really struggled with it. She lost her re-election because of that vote. But then years later, she ran again, right before the Second World War, won, and after Pearl Harbor, she was the only congressperson to vote against the war. Mm -hmm. And she lost again. <laughs> <laughs> so were there a couple more questions in the back? I have an easy question and a comment. Um, how long did you spend on this? I am so impressed. First of all, thank you for doing this. It's really, really interesting. Oh, yeah. How long did I spend? Yeah. And I'm trying to think how many years ago. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, because I had the exhibit up in, in 19, or 2017, so I think I started in about 
2015 or so. Um, and I was at my son's place in Washington, D.C., and I was just scrolling through the internet, or no, and um, the newspapers. I was looking for something else, and I, I ran across my grandfather, hmm. my great grandfather, that Frank Hager. Hmm. And now, as an anti suffrage, I know, what? <laughs> what is this? And so I started to. Mm -hmm. From that, and he wasn't a. It, it, it's not. It's not like he wasn't a mean man or anything. He was very, you know. It's just how he thought, and it's quite amazing to us and our family because everybody kind of expected to be educated, mm -hmm. and we didn't realize that maybe we weren't expected to be educated like that. Eileen, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then oh, you had another question though. Wait, 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 oh. Yeah, no, I have a quick comment just for everybody's um, humor. I did my college thesis on women's suffrage in France. They didn't get the vote until 1945. No, <laughs> so I spent only a year, so I'm so impressed with all the work you did. I wish I had more time. Um, but the quote that everybody has to hear was, one of the reasons that they didn't get the vote was that the men in France said that women's hands were not meant to hold voting ballots, that they were meant to be kissed, kissed devotedly if they're your mother, um, amorously if it's your mistress, and like kindly if it's your wife. <laughs> I, I, I believe it totally, you know, because the arguments were made, oh, yeah. one of the arguments was why uh, women have enough power, they can say no to a marriage proposal. <laughs> that was one of the reasons that was written down, you know. Oh, and the other one was that, um, that if, um, if they walk in a room and there's no seats, the man will get up and let them have a seat. That was another reason why they shouldn't need to vote. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take the vote. <laughs> so I wanted to share that my mother-in-law told, uh, told the story that uh, when she was seven, growing up in a farm in rural Michigan, when the women got the right to vote, she remembered all the women in the community cutting their hair in celebration. Oh, oh gosh. gosh. So did, did African American women, they were completely included in this, or was that another struggle? Because you mentioned No, 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 no. It, 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 they were struggling at the same time yeah. as these other groups. So and at some point they were included, included all women when women got the right to yeah. vote. Right. Okay. Including Native women, right? You had Except a nice not, not, over there. Yeah, yeah. not Native women. Yeah. Now, Native Americans got the right to as uh, later, and mm -hmm. Chinese not until what 1949 or some horrible thing like that. So, I mean, that's my lifetime, and I'm thinking, wow. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mention up front that women's suffrage, women's suffrage is the uh, 2020 theme for the Champlain Valley National Heritage Program, and uh, that's an organization that's. Uh, staffed and managed by the Basin Program, but it's one of, I don't even know how many, you know, 43, 48, 49? 49, 49 um, uh, recognized programs across the United States. Uh, next year's will be Prohibition and Temperance, and next week's speaker will focus on Prohibition and Temperance. Uh, but Jim, I think, just said an additional uh, seven grants have been awarded for women's suffrage projects in New York and Vermont, and I can't remember if there's one up in Quebec in that round as well. So there are a lot of activities that will be happening over the course of the next year. Um, and I think it's exciting that you were here. Uh, Jim suggested that a number of the women in the office go to Middlebury College's uh, museum uh, in December before uh, their exhibit closed. They too worked with students uh, in, in association with some of the professors. And he was amazed that three out of the four women who traveled with him that day got in trouble at the museum. <laughs> he said, how is this even possible? <laughs> uh, but they had a, a terrific exhibit as well. They focused, they had a wonderful video on the historic march into Washington, D.C., uh, where the women uh, campaigning for suffrage were met with a lot of angry people uh, down in D.C. I think one was hospitalized, but several were injured. And I thought, where has this been in my history? So That's my right. yeah. the first picketing of the White House was done for the women's suffrage. Yeah. That's what I read. Yeah. Yeah. That's done that. And yeah. of course, 
all they were doing was standing out front with mm -hmm. signs, and they were arresting. You know, so it was pretty. It was uh, yeah. different times. But, yeah. but the thing is, what happened as a result of my research, I joined the League of Women Voters because I thought, you know, the vote. The, the, these people fought for us to get the vote, so we better help others vote or get out and, and certainly get out and vote ourselves. Wouldn't it be nice if we had 100 percent in one community? It'd be nice if we had <laughs> other than 60 small percent in my <laughs> So when we were choosing our shirts last Thursday, the first one I picked was don't waste the vote. So <laughs> it's important that we all vote no matter what the party. I think when the Lois McClure is traveling the lake this summer, uh, that's the Maritime Museum's um, 1862 replica, you will probably see League of Women Voters at many of her ports of call trying to register people to vote Clean and up. encouraging them to do so. Is the speaker next week related to the family that the Lois McClure was named after? No, not at all. So, and it's uh, pretty remarkable. She she has a degree, um, one of her degrees or concentrations is also in theater or performing arts, so she too is a very animated speaker. It should be fun. Um, I also wanted to thank our co-worker Laura uh, from the resource room who Sometimes staff gets a little worried when I say, I have an idea, because <laughs> it means no. I, I could ask them to do something. So um, we worked, uh, Laura worked with Echo's a button machine, uh, we developed a new skill this week, and um, created a series of buttons and uh, brought about 30. So uh, if you would like one for the year or you want to give a special one to a daughter or granddaughter, uh, please pick one up tonight. Uh, and then, did anyone bring a Susan B. Anthony coin? No. Well, from over there, <laughs> you'll see them right by the door at the top of the ramp. So, thank you very much for coming in. Helen, will you be here for another minute or two if they have a one-on-one -on -one question? Sure, sure. Okay, great. So, thank you again.